My one point that I want you guys to take away from this message is to tame your tongue, you must let God tame your heart. Ooh, that's good, Cosby. <laughs> you may be wondering what that even means to let God tame your heart, but stick with me and we'll get into it a bit later. So verses 3 through 10 give a few really neat images to help describe the power of the tongue. Okay, so the first is the bit in a horse's mouth. So as you can see from this picture, that is a bit. Um, it's just a tiny piece of metal with some metal circles on the ends. In comparison, a Clydesdale horse is about six feet tall and anywhere from 1,700 to 2,200 pounds. Okay, they are massive. I could run and body slam the horse, it wouldn't even budge. Does that say much since I'm 5'2"? Probably not. But some of you that are much bigger than I could probably do that and it still would. I mean, 2,200 pounds. It's but that tiny bit can completely change the direction of that 2,000 pound animal. And that's how much power it has. <laughs> the next analogy that he gives is a ship rudder, which is probably lost on us a little bit because many of us have probably not been on a ship. Um, so here's a graphic. Um, compared to this incredibly huge boat, the rudder is right there, that tiny gray little rectangle, okay? That's like, you know, real size on a boat, but in proportion to the rest of the boat, that's how small it is. But it steers the entire ship in a different direction. Something so small can have the greatest impact on something so much larger than the whole. And then this last image, um, in his last image, is about one spark that causes an entire great forest to catch fire. So here's some sparks. Um, this brought to mind how there have been some gender reveals, I don't know if y'all have heard about this, that use like a pyrotechnic with smoke or whatever to like be pink or blue and reveal the gender of the baby and it's all fun and games um, until this happens. Um, so in one instance, those sparks caused a 7,000 acre forest fire and 25 fatalities. Um, another gender reveal, this guy like shot at this box that was supposed to explode with smoke and there were sparks instead. So it started a fire that was probably just as big as this front area that I'm standing in and it went on to damage 45,000 acres and costed $8 million worth of damages. Okay, So one spark seems really small until you see the damage that ensues from them. All of this is to further emphasize how big of a deal it is to tame the tongue. James says the tongue is a restless evil full of deadly poison. And I can think of multiple instances where something someone said to me stuck with me and really hurt me. I'm sure you guys can think of some examples too. I had some friends in college that I did a youth internship with and there were four of us total. They were some of my closest friends at the time. And we uh, essentially had to fill out these reports to the women that were supervising us um, to kind of give a recap of the week and how ministry was. And one day they organized a meeting, the supervisors did, with all four of us, and said that the other three had been writing about me negatively in their reports. So, which in and of itself is not bad, right? Like, they're their supervisors. They were maybe trying to get advice on how to deal with problems they were having with me. Um, but that conversation that we had just kind of led to figuring out that they had had problems for a while and had been talking about me with each other for months um, in very negative ways without bringing it up to me. And uh, the things they were saying were extremely hurtful. I mean, these were like my best friends at the time. And to find out that all this unresolved conflict was happening for months um, and all that negativity just really brought me down. So we resolved, they said sorry. But the trajectory of my friendships with them turned in this completely different direction from that day on. <coughs> um, a girl in that same group of friends was one of my first roommates. She was arguably the closest girl um, that I was, or the girl I was closest to at the time. And she got upset because I went on a date with the guy that she was interested in. And so I started to notice these little side conversations happening in my apartment when I would get home that would like get quiet as soon as I walked in. Um, and when I went to confront her about it and asked what was going on, she was like, oh, nothing's wrong. We're good. And I just knew she was lying um, because girls that I was also living with were telling me what she was telling them about me. And it was all really negative. You can see what's happening. 
Um, my friend had the opportunity to use her rudder and steer our friendship back on course when confronted, but she let fear or malice or whatever it was to keep our friendship on this dismal trajectory. And we are not friends anymore. Um, not really because of anything other than what happened in that situation. And she never really could confront what was going on. So our friendship just kind of ended and it left me feeling really sad. Um, gossip and talking about other people is so damaging and hurtful. Maybe you have found yourself spreading around gossip or talking about people around you. And I think it's one thing to ask someone like a mentor for advice about a situation on how to handle it. And in doing that, you need to give your perspective about the situation. But I'm talking about when we just want to talk about other people because we just want to talk about them. Uh, there's no other reason than to make fun of or just kind of spill tea and think it's fun to talk about. Um, there was one time that there was a guy in our ministry that would be pretty loud responding to things in sermons. Um, and I had like joked about it with my friends because I thought it was funny. Um, and we were at a summer focus and during the sermon, it was just like over and over, like him explaining things, like when the preacher would say something, which again is not wrong, but I just wanted to make fun of him, I guess, I don't know. And so I went to text my friend um, to like make fun of him and I sent it to him. So, um, okay, and this was before undue send, okay? Like undue send was not a thing. And so he got my text and there was nothing but own up to it. Um, and I just felt this pit in my stomach. It was the worst feeling. Um, but, are you guys all confessing that you've done that before? Um, but, did I feel bad because I said what I said or because I got caught? Um, okay. Because I said what I said. Was I upset because I said what I said or because that person found out that I said it? Maturity and taming the tongue isn't that we just get good at who we tell things to. It shapes what even comes out of our mouths. So the first way... <laughs> maturity and taming the tongue isn't that we just get good at who we tell things to. It shapes what even comes out of our mouths. So the first way I see this affecting us is gossip. Um, it's a big one, arguably the thing that comes to mind first when you think of this topic of taming the tongue. Um, another story, when my sister got pregnant, she wanted to be pretty sensitive about who knew in the first few months just because there's a higher risk of miscarriage, and so she told some close friends and family, and that's pretty much it. And then she was at church talking with this group of women that she wasn't really close to, and one of them was like, oh, congratulations. And my sister was like, oh, on what? And she said, oh, you're pregnant. And my sister was instantly like, who told you that? And you could tell this other girl was just so uncomfortable. And she told my sister that one of their mutual friends that my sister had told had been telling people and just saying, don't tell anyone I told you that. And telling people. Gossip doesn't have to be this maliciously evil information or criticism or making fun of people, but it can just be spreading around information that isn't yours to share. It's not that it always reveals this wickedness that is on purpose, but it reveals some of our desire to just be relevant or see someone's reaction to news. I see that some in dating in this community. Um, I don't know if any of you have experienced this, but you agree to go on a date and then someone you barely know is like, oh, how was your date with so-and-so? And you're like, who are you? <laughs> and how do you know that? It's because it's more fun to talk about spilled tea than pick up a towel and clean it up. Ooh. Listen, everything I'm saying to you, the spirit already ran me over. <laughs> Revived me so that I could run you. <laughs> it's more fun to talk about spilled tea than pick up a towel and clean it up. What's ironic is that the phrase spill the tea originated with a capital T for truth. But now it's used like spilling gossip for what's going on with other people, their truth. Not your own, just someone else's truth. <laughs> That's more fun. Let's be people that instead of engaging in gossip and talk that isn't honoring to others, call it out and challenge each other. If we want to be mature, we have to take part in changing the course of the conversation, not contributing to it. It's okay to be excited about your friends going on a date, but it's not your information to share with other people unless you've asked them and they're okay with it. 
That can cause some problems because then if nothing comes from one or two dates, the fire is already spreading. The spark, you know, what started as a spark in regards to anything can quickly become an uncontrolled forest fire causing so much damage. Even if you had good intentions, like a simple gender reveal, it doesn't matter because the damage is ensuing. It only, not only affects you, but the people around you. James 1 tells us to be slow to speak and quick to listen. I was reading an article that Brandon's wife Sarah shared with me, and it's talking about the difference between gossip and conferral, which is basically asking advice from someone about a situation. It says the Bible condemns and prohibits gossip, yet it commends conferral for the sake of building up fellow brothers and sisters in Christ. And so it gives these helpful um, questions to ask yourself to determine if you're conferring or if you're gossiping. And so you guys can take a picture of this. You can jot it down. I think this has been really helpful. It's important to seek wisdom and counsel from wiser people for any of the first reasons in these questions. But often I don't think that we're sharing information with any of those things in mind other than the second parts because of curiosity, broadcasting someone's secrets to get a response, or venting frustration. Um, the first gossiper was Satan in the garden with Adam and Eve. He asks, did God really say that you couldn't eat from the tree? He's distorting the truth and spreading lies and misinformation about God. One spark that caused the biggest forest fire. <laughs> when we engage in gossip, we're choosing to look more like the deceiver than the savior. In that same article, you can go to the next one, um, that Sarah shared with me, it talks about gossip and where we can find that in scripture. And there's two phrases that stand out in the original Greek that give a more direct connection between gossip and sin. So they are slanderer and doing evil with words. Okay, so those are the two phrases. Um, so you can go to the next one. The Greek word diabolos is used to refer to the adversary and is translated devil in 34 places in the New Testament. For example, when Jesus is tempted in the wilderness, it says, Then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil, diabolos. This Greek word also described the devil during the Last Supper in John 13. The devil, Diabolos, had already put it into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him. The adversary, Diabolos, the devil, put it into Jesus, Judas's heart to betray Jesus, which then leads to Jesus' crucifixion. Paul uses this same Greek word to describe those who engage in gossip. In these cases, it translates to slanderer instead of devil. So here's some examples of that up here. The fact that the same word is used to describe the devil and gossipers emphasizes how serious gossip should be taken. Okay, so then you can go to the next one. The second phrase, doing evil with words, comes from 3 John. Um, so that example is up there. At the end of it, it says, he is disparaging us with wicked words, and then it gives that phrase, and he is not content with that. So gossip is willfully engaging in evil, using words to harm another person. When we gossip, we go against God and his people and align ourselves with the adversary. The ironic thing is that the devil not only wants to destroy um, the kingdom work, but wants to see our destruction as well. So sometimes we use our tongues to slander and speak against other people or even God. And this, again, is modeled after Satan with the example above. We lie about people or spread misinformation to put people down or make people think negatively about other people. In James 3, verse 9, James says, With the tongue we praise our Lord and Father, and with it we curse human beings who have been made in God's likeness. God pays attention not only to the words that we speak to him, but also to the words that we say about his creation. Every word we speak is unto him, not merely the ones we intentionally address to him. So we need to be very careful with how we use our tongues when it comes to his image bearers. What would it look like to instead use your tongue to talk through your conflicts or your problems? Or use your tongues to speak words of encouragement instead of complaining? <coughs> In James 4, when he's talking about there being quarrels and fights among them and jealousy causing them to speak against each other, he says friendship with the world means enmity against God. 
We look exactly like the world when we gossip, when we tear each other down, when we lie, or when we speak untruth. And when we are friends with the world, we can't be friends of God. Rather, we become his enemies. Okay, so the next slide. Uh, maybe your town steers conversation more towards you and less towards knowing the people around you. In your conversations with one another, are you slow to speak and quick to listen? Or is it the other way around, where you talk the whole time, ask no questions, and use anything the other person says to go back to what you want to talk about? Again, this isn't inherently sinful, but it is a mark of immaturity. Maybe your tongue steers conversations towards boasting rather than humility, or just pride in general. You're quick to talk about how good you are, and how right you are, and how smart you are. James 4 also warns against boasting in our pretentious plans and how such boasting is evil. Do you see how this motif is being woven through the different chapters of James? This can be revealing that your heart is more centered on you than on others, is puffed up with pride rather than bowed in humility. We must let God change us to look more like him and put others above ourselves. Maturity in this area looks like listening more than you talk. It's good to share interests and be open about things going on in your life, but not at the expense of neglecting to build others up around you. You have two ears and one mouth for a reason. I'm sure you all have heard that saying. Instead of puffing yourself up, use your tongue to sing praises to God and lift others around you up, rather than using it to exalt yourselves. Okay, you can go to the next one. Another way we let our tongues go wild and look like the world around us is commiserating and complaining. As disciples, we should not be connecting through complaining. As disciples, we should not be connecting through complaining. I think it's so funny that in awkward situations that you're with a stranger, it's so much easier to like talk about the things that are going wrong in your life. It's like, complain about how hot it is outside, or how much this class and the professor suck, or how much homework you have, or blah, 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 blah. That is not using your tongue to steer others toward maturity. That can reveal discontentment in our hearts. We must let God tame our hearts and be full of gratitude for what we have. The other day I was complaining to Jessica about how my new iPhone 16 wouldn't be here until October 12th. <laughs> even though I ordered it a month before that. What a disgusting thing to let come out of my mouth, y'all. How often do you find yourself complaining that you have no food in your fridge when you're staring at food that you just don't want to eat? <laughs> And would you do that if any of the starving children in Guinea were standing next to you? Do you think that they complain about eating plain rice every day? What about your education? How often do you find yourself complaining about school or homework? There are children around the world who have to walk miles to and from school just for basic education. It reveals pride and entitlement in our hearts that we must let God tame and mature to look more like his. Yeah. He didn't complain about dying his brutal death on the cross, true suffering. In fact, he considered it joy, like we saw in James 1. Let God create a heart in you that is full of gratitude for what you have. Be thankful that you can read, write, see sunsets, give your friends a hug. Use your tongue in general. There's so much to be grateful for, and praise should be on our tongues instead of complaining. We should then let hearts that are full of gratitude propel our mission for Jesus forward. With the good news overflowing in our hearts, how can we not go out and speak about it? Rather than praising Jesus for what he did for us on the cross and the new life he offers us with him, we complain about how the blessings he's given us aren't enough. What example is this setting for new believers or even people who aren't Christian? So many people are turned away from Christianity because their words don't line up with their actions. Let us not be that way, but let our gratitude and praise be what draws people to want to learn more about what Jesus is actually all about. We also use our tongues for obscenity and coarse joking. We laugh at other people's expense or just throw unnecessary cuss words into a conversation. For what? Like, what does it do to the conversation to add in F-bombs as descriptive words? Other than show the world you're just like them. Are the jokes that you're laughing about crude with sexual innuendos? Are they suggestive? And how is that building someone up around you? 
We must not let any unwholesome talk come out of our mouths. So, I've talked at length about ways that our wild tongue makes sparks fly and the fires that ensue. This set of scriptures in James 3 talks about how no human being can tame the tongue. So what are we supposed to do? And we come back. To tame your tongue, we must let God tame our hearts. The emphasis on this one point is that we must let God tame our hearts and our tongues. You cannot tame your tongue, but the one who made it can. The definition of tame in this verb context is to make less powerful and easier to control. He gives the example of how we can tame all kinds of animals. I was going to put pictures on the slide, but it was making me really sad of like circus animals and SeaWorld whales. So I'm just going to say that I was like, oh, I'll put pictures up there for the illustration. I was like, okay. But think about some of the animals that you see at a circus, a lion or a tiger or elephant. They do all kinds of things that seem so unnatural because they are. It is unnatural. In the wild, they would never just approach a human and balance on a ball or jump through a hoop at the beckon of a human's hand. And there are stories of orca whales at SeaWorld who have killed trainers because their instincts take over, even though they have been raised from infancy to do tricks and entertain people at shows. Our hearts, because of sin, are bent towards chaos and sin. We must submit our hearts to God's authority and control in order to produce kingdom wisdom and maturity. Even though our instincts will take over and get in the way, his grace abounds. But we must make the choice every day to not give in to our animalistic instincts and instead lay at the feet of our master, Jesus Christ. Only when we submit our hearts to him can he mold and shape them to look more like his. Luke 6.45 says, A good man brings good things out of the good stored up in his heart, and an evil man brings evil things out of the evil stored up in his heart. For the mouth speaks what the heart is full of. We must let God change our hearts to where what is flowing out is full of him, is full of his wisdom. And at the end of James 3, there's a list of qualities that characterize godly wisdom. It is pure, peace-loving, considerate, submissive, full of mercy and good fruit, impartial and sincere. As we let God change our hearts to be full of these qualities, that is what will flow out of us. If we don't let him change our hearts and mature us in godly wisdom, if we continue in friendship with the world, then what comes out won't be pure peace-loving, considerate, full of mercy, etc. You can't dip a cup into a puddle of dirty, contaminated water and fill up a glass of clean (coughs) water. Likewise, you can't expect godly things to come out of your mouth if what's in your heart is full of worldly wisdom, bitter envy, selfish ambition, things that are earthly, unspiritual, and demonic. So we must let God tame our hearts into submission to his wisdom. But even though no human being can tame the tongue, God gave us a door that we can shut and lock. God gave you a mouth (laughs) that we can choose to open or close. That comes from Ronnie Worsham. I said, what would you tell a group of college students about taming the tongue? And he said, God, uh, no human being can tame the tongue, but God gave you a door that you can shut. So shut up. (laughs) But I excluded that. Sometimes we do just need to shut up. Be slow to speak and quick to listen. Think and pray and discern before you open your mouth and let your tongue go. Mature people do not spot off everything that comes to their minds to say, and they especially don't use their tongues to call themselves mature. Mature people aren't engaging in rude or degrading Facebook arguments about their political candidate or degrading the person that isn't their candidate. And I've been so irked by this election season, y'all, and how hateful even our candidates are towards each other. I can't even listen to 10 minutes of the debates that I've seen because there's no respect or honor given to the other person. And then we, the people, go on Facebook or spark debates in our own circles and spout off the same hate towards our candidate's opponent and towards God's creation that have different convictions from us. Whose disciple are you? Whose student are you? Who are you imitating? Mature people aren't talking about everything that they know. 
We can be thoughtful about when we open our mouths and when we just leave them closed. But to tame the tongue, we must let God tame our hearts. Examples of when you should leave the door closed are when it comes to gossip, puffing yourself up, lying or slandering someone else, complaining or commiserating, coarse language and joking. You should open your mouth when you are conferring with someone to bring godly wisdom into a situation. You should open your mouth and use your tongue to build others up around you. The world can always use some more encouragement. And we can, comp this is just a little bit of a side, but we can compliment people across genders, and it doesn't have to mean you want to marry that person. <laughs> like, a lot of people, like, I can't say this to them. We can compliment people across genders, and it doesn't have to mean you want to marry them. <laughs> a lot of you guys know Brett, that used to work here, yeah. Yeah. and Steon. And they worked with me, and they would compliment me after I got my hair done, or if I was wearing a nice outfit, or if I got my nails done. And Rhett and Steon are my brothers in Christ. Not everything has to be romantic, but we can just build up our brothers and sisters around us. We don't just need compliments about someone's appearance or menial tasks, but we can really build one another up in the Lord. Affirm Christian qualities in someone. Tell them that you're thankful for them. Share what exactly you appreciate about their friendship. Tell your corpus if you like their topic for core. Have you ever just gotten a text from someone that they're thinking about you or that they love you and it just brightens up your day? And especially men, the men in the room, I encourage you to be more free-flowing in your relationships with one another in terms of your encouragement. Yeah. It you less as iron sharp as iron. If you love your bros, tell them. I love you, bro. Do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, 
but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, with whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Get rid of all bitterness, rage, and anger, brawling, and slander, along with every form of malice. Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as Christ God forgave you. This passage is titled, Unity and Maturity in the Body of Christ. This is a good blueprint on how to use the tongue and show maturity in your faith to bring unity to the people around you. Maturing looks like putting off the old self and putting on the new self, created to be like God. Do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only what is helpful for building others up in accordance with their needs. If someone around you needs to hear the truth, then speak it to them, but in love. Earlier, I referenced James 4 when he talks about how boasting is evil, but James 5 goes on to say that we should use our tongues to confess our sin to each other and pray for each other. How about instead of using your tongue to judge others around you for their sin, you use it to confess your own, and you make it right. We also see in James 5 to let our yes be yes and our no be no, and not to use our tongues to swear. Back to James 3, it says that out of the same mouth comes blessing and cursing, and that this should not be. We can't interchangeably get clean water and dirty water out of the same puddle. Rather, use your tongue to sing praises to God. Use your tongue to make promises that you will keep. Be a person of integrity. Use your tongue to pray for the people around you. Use your tongue to honor people and not tear them down. Don't give the devil a foothold to make you look more like him. Rather, mature to look more like Jesus. We have so many examples in James alone of ways that we can use our tongues for the purpose of the kingdom. Praise team, you guys can come on up. To tame the tongue, we must let God change our hearts. And I hope that you will let God continue to mature and tame your hearts give you discernment, and allow you to use the small rudder of your tongue to speak things into our broken world that change the course, headed towards destruction, back to the path that is headed towards the kingdom. I'm going to pray for you guys. God, we thank you. Um, you are so, so good to us, and we thank you for making us um, to be in your image. And I just pray that we would take these words to heart, that your spirit would stir up anything that you really want us to think about or repent of or make right, and that we would be a body that would really build each other up and point others to look more like you. We love you, and in your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you. 